algorithms for path edge sampling by Shelby Kimmel. I'll take it away. Can you hear me? Okay, and thank you so much to the organizers. This was a really well-organized and fun conference to attend, so thank you. Today I'm gonna to be talking about an algorithm for path edge sampling uh, that is joint work with my collaborators, Faith C. Jeffrey and Alvaro Piedrafita. But uh, before I get into this algorithm and this problem of path edge sampling, I wanna motivate it by talking about two similar problems. So the first is given a maze with an entrance point S and an exit point T, we can try to answer the yes, no question, is there a path from S to T? And so if I flash a path, Hopefully that can convince you that yes, in this case there is a path from S to T. The second problem is what is that path? So in this case you would wanna return the specific set of directions that you should take, straight, left, right, and so on, to get from S to T. So one of these problems is just the decision version of the other. Um, but while these problems seem very similar, they seem to have quite wildly different complexity in certain situations. So this is most, most clearly uh, typified or uh, exemplified by the welded tree graph. Um, so here we're no longer trying to navigate a maze, but instead we have a starting node uh, S, in this case labeled entrance, and an exit node, RT node, and we can travel from node to node in the graph. Um, but again, we might tr want to try to answer these two questions. Is there, is there a path from S to T, and what is the path from S to T? Um, but it seems like, especially in this welded tree graph, these two problems are have very different complexities. So actually this problem of is there a path from S to T in this particular problem, it's trivial. We already know just based on the structure of this graph that there is not just one path, but there's many paths. So you can answer yes without even looking at the graph. But as far as we know, we haven't been able to find an efficient quantum or classical algorithm that can actually find that path from S to T. Um, so recent work on this by Childs, Gudran, and Galani, which was presented earlier this week at the conference, uh, showed that for certain types of algorithms, there's no way to find a path. Also by Ancestors Manus, or, um, now quite a few years ago, again, ruling out certain classes of algorithms for finding a path. But we have no rigorous proof showing that finding a path is harder than just kind of, is, is really hard. So it's an open question, how hard is it to find the path from S to T? Okay, so these two questions and trying to understand their complexity partially motivates the problem and the algorithm that I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, so we're interested in a related problem, not to say yes or no, there is a path, or to find the path, but rather we would just like to find one edge that is on a path. Okay, so this is clearly a strictly easier problem than finding the whole path, because if you can find the whole path, you definitely have found at least one edge on the path. But by kind of Focusing on one very like, particular aspect of this problem, we can hope to maybe disentangle some of what is making the problem either hard or easy. Um, so that, that's part of the motivation for why we want to study this problem. Okay, um, so I, I'll kind of give you the punchline up front. I'll kind of describe our model and describe our results, and then for the rest of the talk, I'll give more details. So if you're not totally familiar with any of the terminology I use on this slide, I'm going to explain it more in detail later. But the model that we use that we're um, looking at is we assume we have oracle access to the adjacency matrix of an undirected uh, end vertex graph. And that that graph, if there is a path from S to T, has effective resistance R. And I'll explain more about that all later. But in this, and I'll just say this model is different from the model of the welded trees problem but we can still ask these same types of questions and again try to build up understanding of these problems in a slightly different model and find kind of related information. Okay, so it's already, people have studied the problem of path detection and path finding in this model. Um, and Bellavs and Reichardt, um, with some follow-up work with me and some students, showed that you can detect a path with a number of average number of queries that scales like n square root of r, where r is that effective resistance, and the tilde on the big O hides um, log factors, um, whereas pathfinding requires n to the three halves queries. So actually in this case, and that was uh, from work from Dur et al. So in this case, r in the worst case can be of size n, 
So it turns out in this model, in the worst case, path detection and path finding are the same complexity, the same difficulty. So we don't see that wildly different separation that we saw in the welded trees. But what's kind of interesting here is that when you have a graph with small effective resistance, which um, I'll tell you more about <laughs> what that means later, but then in that case, there is a separation between what we know these two algorithms can do, although again, we don't really have formal lower bounds separating them. So with a small effective resistance, it seems we can find an et, find, determine whether there is a path or not faster than finding the whole path. Okay, so where does edge finding fit between these two problems? What we find is that it has the same complexity as detecting a path. So finding a single edge on a path is essentially as hard as determining is there a path or not. So it's no harder than that. Okay, um, so this is one of our main results, but now you might be thinking, well, it seems like if you want to find a whole path, isn't that just a sequence of finding single edges on a path? So is there a way that you can use this edge finding algorithm as maybe a subroutine and use it to find the whole path? And so we, we are able to do that, but only in certain cases. So if there's a unique path, a single path from S to T, then we are, in that case, able to get an advantage and able to take advantage of graphs where there is a smaller effective resistance to get an improvement. Okay, so that's the kind of punchline of my talk, but now I'll get into some more of the details. So just to go into our problem setup about this oracle and the adjacency matrix, we imagine that we have some parent graph where when I have edges, dotted edges between vertices, that means that that's a place where there might be an edge in our graph G or there might not, we don't know yet. And to answer that question, we're given an oracle, which is this black box, and we can query the oracle, we can input an edge, UV, and then the output of the oracle would be one if there's an edge there and zero otherwise. So we can repeatedly ask questions of this oracle um, and learn where the edges are in the graph. Of course, with a quantum algorithm, we can ask this question in superposition. But so after using this oracle a bunch of times, we might learn that the places where the edges actually are are these kind of darker solid lines and there aren't edges in the other locations. So our true graph might look something like this and this is the graph where we're trying to find um, an edge on a path from S to T. And just to remind you, a path is a sequence of distinct vertices connected by edges. So basically that means a path can't have a cycle on it. It should just be a, a sequence of edges, of vertices with no, without any repeats. So in this particular graph, there are two paths, SVT and SVUT. And so our algorithm would be successful if we could return any of these edges that I've highlighted in red here. Okay, and then our figure of merit, the thing that we're trying to optimize is the average query complexity. And so that's just the average number of times that we need to use that oracle, that black box, in order to return an edge that's on a path with high probability. Okay, and from the earlier slide, I said the, the, key fi like the key parameter that we're parameterizing our problem by and that seems to control the query complexity is the effective resistance of our graph between S and T. So if we, have, if we think of our graph now as an electrical network where we connect a battery between S and T, and then we, everywhere there is an edge in the graph, we put a, a, a wire with a one ohm resistor then our, this electrical network is equivalent to much, a much simpler electrical network where there's just one resistor, but that has a higher or potentially lower resistance than one R. So R is the kind of equivalent electrical resistance of this graph. Okay, so I'm not gonna have time, this is uh, like, I'm not gonna have time to get into the details of effective resistance. Uh, you can you know, look at your favorite undergrad electricity and magnetism textbook to learn more, but I will just say the effective resistance is always uh, less than or equal to the shortest path between S and T. And if there are many paths, that tends to decrease the effective resistance. So graphs with short paths between S and T and many paths between S and T tend to have smaller effective resistance. And so just to remind you what I had on that earlier slide, what we find is that to find a path to find an edge that is on a path between S and T uses n to the square root of R queries. So it, again, somehow our, our algorithm is able to take advantage of 
graphs where there are many short paths to more quickly find an edge that is on a path. And one, one thing that we also show is that this problem is hard for a classical computer. So, so far I've just been kind of talking about the quantum query complexity of different problems, but we can also just compare to how well a classical computer can do, and we show, can show that even for the case of small effective resistance, a classical computer can't take advantage of that, and it requires n squared queries in all cases. Um, so, and the graph only has order n squared edges. So that's like once you have queried all n squared edges, you know the whole graph and you can kind of find a path and find an edge. And so this is saying that a classical algorithm basically needs to query almost all the edges in the graph before it can find a single edge that is on a path. And just uh, in the worst case, the effective resistance is of size n. So in the worst case, the quantum algorithm takes uh, n to the three halves queries. So we always get an advantage from using a quantum computer for this problem. You know, not huge, n to the squared versus n to the three halves, but a, a modest query advantage. Okay, so you uh, very likely don't remember, but actually the title of this talk with, was Path Edge Sampling. And so far, I haven't been talking about sampling anything. I've just been talking about finding an edge. So what it, but it turns out that actually our algorithm not, doesn't only find an edge that's on an ST path, but samples from a distribution that's pretty interesting. Um, and that distribution has to do with the way that uh, current flows in that electrical circuit that I was mentioning before. Um, so current in, a, in an electrical circuit try, kind of seeks out the shortest and easiest path, the path of least resistance. So in this case, um, the current going, like all the current in this circuit has to go from S to V because there's only that one possibility. So the current across that edge is one. But now to get from V to T, it has two options, one of which is kind of easier, the shorter path, and one of which is harder. And so more of the electrons flow through the shorter path. And so we get a current, in this case, of two thirds on the shorter path and of one third on the longer path. And so our algorithm samples from edges, path edges, in a way that's proportional to the current squared. So if you take these currents, you square them, you normalize them, that gives you the probability with which our algorithm samples. Um, so in this case, we get probabilities that look like this. And now this is kind of intriguing because we see we have a very high probability, 0.6, of sampling the SV edge. And that's the edge that is on all of the paths. So it's like, Edges that are on many paths or on all of the paths, we're more likely to sample those edges. And also edges that are on short paths, we're much more likely to sample. So this seems like a pretty useful primitive to find, somehow find what seems to be the more important edges in our graph, the ones that are on many paths and the ones that are on short paths, assuming your goal is to find a short path. If your goal is to find a long path, maybe this is less helpful. Okay, so that's the, the basics of our algorithm. But now we wanted to take the subroutine, like I said, it seems like a pretty useful primitive, and see if we can solve other related problems using our path sampling algorithm as a subroutine. Uh, so the first application that we look at is finding bottlenecks in graphs. So we imagine we have two highly connected subgraphs, one that contains our starting vertex S, one that contains our ending vertex T. Um, and now we assume that there's maybe one or two edges that are connecting these two highly connected subgraphs, and we'd like to find those bottleneck points. And now because, as I just said in the previous slide, our algorithm naturally has this property that it targets those edges, is more likely to, to return those edges that are on many paths, like this edge in the middle is on every single path from S to T. And so what we can show is that our algorithm, like for a graph like this, with constant probability will return that bottleneck edge. Um, in the case when these uh, subgraphs are expanders. So that seems like a useful primitive for kind of understanding different properties of your network. Um, the second application that I'd like to talk about is, and that I mentioned earlier on in the talk, is what if we want to just now take our algorithm that finds individual edges and use it to find the whole path? Can, when can we do better with this new algorithm as a subroutine? Um, so, so far, we've only been able to get an advantage in the case where there's a single path. So like in this graph, there aren't multiple paths like we had before. There's just one, only one unique way to get from S to T. 
Okay, so if we imagine a graph like this with a single path, I'm gonna just stretch it out. And so you can see there might be cycles coming off of it, but if we were to try to take that cycle, we would have a cycle in our path, which then would make it not a path. Okay, so in this case, we have ju just this one, one path from S to T. All the current just must flow along this path, and so the current on every single edge will be the same. It will just be one on every single edge of the path. So that means we have an equal probability of measuring, of sampling from every edge on this path. Okay, so in particular, that means that with high probability, we're going to find an edge that's in the middle-ish part of this graph. Say like, with high probability, we'll find a graph that's in the middle nine-tenths of this graph. Oops, sorry, find an edge that is in the middle nine-tenths of this graph. So say we find this yellow edge here. Well then once you do that, the problem splits up into two smaller sized subproblems. So we can now just create a recursive algorithm and do a divide and conquer approach. I mean, there, there's actually a lot of details because the sampling is not always accurate, but um, we can basically do a divide and conquer algorithm. And this algorithm is actually very similar to quicksort, for those of you who are familiar, where in quicksort there's a pivot, but you don't know that the pivot is definitely gonna be in the middle, but you know with high probability it's gonna be somewhere close to the middle. And so using techniques like uh, you use to analyze quicksort, we can analyze this algorithm and we can show that for the case of, uh, ca the case where we have a path with, um, here L is the number of edges in the path, so when L is small, which again corresponds to a small effective resistance, in that case now we do get an advantage for finding the whole path. Whereas before, the, the previous best algorithm could not get any advantage even if there was a short path. So now we have a way to find the path in the case that there is a short path. And so our algorithm gets an advantage over the prior state of the art in the case when the path is less than about square root of n. Okay, just very briefly, I'll mention what's going on under the hood of our algorithm. So it's based on a span program algorithm, and a span, program, span programs are a way of designing quantum algorithms. They're kind of a linear algebraic formalism. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details, but the, maybe the important part is that when you're doing the analysis of a span program algorithm, algorithm there's this important uh, parameter or important vector called the witness vector. And this is not a vector that is actually created in the algorithm, it's just a tool used in the analysis. But what we do is we actually create an algorithm that creates a quantum state proportional to this vector that shows up in the analysis of span programs. And in the case of when, for the span program algorithm for ST, um, for deciding whether there's a path between S and T, that yes, no question, this witness vector is exactly a superposition of edges on paths from S to T with the appropriate, with amplitudes proportional to the current. So all we do is we use our algorithm that generates a state proportional to the positive witness vector and then measured in the standard basis and we sample from edges with the distribution that I've described today. But I'll just, I'm putting this up here because our, to let you know that our algorithm, the kind of underlying algorithm is actually more general. It can apply to any span program algorithm. We found it most useful to apply to this particular span program for uh, deciding whether there's a path, but there might be other uses too. So with that, I'll close with some open questions. The first of which is what I just said, like this algorithm is more general. It could be used, applied to any span program algorithm. So maybe there are other uh, ways that we can, other problems where this will be, give us an interesting sampling algorithm. But I think the, the problem that I'm most interested and curious about is how, how can we better use this sampling distribution to find a whole path? So like I said, it's kind of tantalizing that we're more likely to sample edges that are on many paths and that are on short paths, but as yet we could only really leverage this to find a whole path in the case where there's a single path, which then doesn't really take advantage of this interesting distribution. But for us, just the analysis got too complicated, there were too many special cases that we couldn't quite figure out, but I would encourage anyone to think about this problem, it's a nice problem to think about. Um, and then, you know, back to this bigger question of what is the complexity of path detection versus path finding, I think that's a really interesting, big open problem in the field, but I think there's also a lot of little, like smaller problems that we can look at to kind of examine this bigger problem, like the one that I did today. I think there's lots of other problems like that, and I would encourage us to seek out and study those problems. And if you like this talk and are interested in this topic, I hope you'll check out the paper Elf's Trees and Quantum Locks, which was presented earlier this week by Stephen Piddick.
um, which is a related algorithm, but with a totally different application from what we look at. So thanks to you for listening, my funding, and my collaborators. Shelby, yeah, thanks for the great talk. Can you comment a bit on, on runtime or circuit depth or like actual algorithmic cost? Yeah, so there, do I even have a slide? Oh, I did. So in the case where that parent graph is a complete graph, the query complexity and the time complexity are the same up to additional log factors. So, but when the parent graph is, has more structure, um, especially if it was like some random structure, then I don't think there would necessarily be an efficient, a time efficient algorithm, but yeah, if you, go back and replace query complexity with time complexity throughout my talk, you know, that's not, that's basically correct for parent graphs that are complete. Oh, and the space complexity, it's uh, logarithmic in the number of edges in the graph, so it's pretty space efficient too. Uh, sorry if I missed it earlier, but you're showing average query complexity. What is the average being taken over? What, is, what do I mean by average? Yeah. Um, so if you don't, if you don't, if you had a bound on R ahead of time, on the effective resistance ahead of time, you would kind of know when to stop the algorithm, but if you don't know when R, if you don't know R ahead of time, you kind of have to iter 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 iteratively stop the algorithm after like time two, after time four, after time eight, and see if it's completed. And there's some probability that you will like not detect that it should have been completed and kind of run it for too long. So that average is kind of the average runtime um, in that sense. Hey, thanks for the nice talk. Um, so I missed it earlier, but I'm just curious what happens if you have a graph and you don't know the number of paths. Like, can you put this into your algorithm, and then if there's no path, your algorithm fails, and if there's more than one path, your algorithm fails in a detectable way? Or do you really need to know if there is a unique path in order to use this? Yeah, so you, you don't need to, I mean, you could always run, first run the algorithm for path detection first, and that would take, and to the square root of R queries, and then from there, if there was, if then you know there's a path, then with the same query complexity, you could just find an edge on the path. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Thanks for the talk, Shelby. Um, I'm curious if there is a simple intuition for how to construct these oracles, or if that's like case dependent how this would work in practice? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think it, yeah, I mean, ideally it would be, there would be a simple function that the oracle was hiding, but maybe a function that is, um, you know, you can't, you kind of have to evaluate it to know the answer. I, I don't have a good example of an instantiation. Um, yeah, I'm kind of imagining that there's maybe some QRAM <laughs> that you have that is storing the, providing the information to the Oracle. But yeah, that's kind of, there's, there's a little bit of a gap here between what, how would this really be used in practice if you wanted to instantiate this on a quantum computer? Yeah, thank you for all the questions, those were great. Well, let's thank the, thank the speaker again. <laughs>